Welcome to Simplifying Remote Collaboration. In each episode, we'll discuss how the shift to hybrid working and learning has put growing pressure on IT departments to better support remote collaboration. At a time when resources are stretched thin by competing priorities, we'll explore ways to simplify the IT setup and management of hybrid spaces. Hey everybody, welcome back to Simplifying Remote Collaboration. I'm your host for today, Ben Thomas. When you look at enterprise office spaces, uh, the function has completely changed over the last five to 10 years. Not only are they, they places of work, but they're content creation studios, uh, they're collaboration spaces, they're think tanks. There are so many different things that now uh, they're having to be leveraged for. And a lot of the burden uh, of keeping up with that technology and function has fallen on the technology teams. And what naturally has happened is a lot of these spaces have been forced to retrofit instead of doing a, a complete redesign. So I wanted to have a conversation today with somebody uh, really who knows not only a ton about uh, the AV and the IT industry as a whole as an educator, but somebody who can actually provide some practical tips. Uh, and that's Chuck Espinoza over at Aurora. Chuck, thanks so much for coming on today. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, Chuck, you've got probably 45 titles, I feel like, on at the end of your, your name on LinkedIn now. Uh, imagine every CTS certification you could possibly have, you have. Uh, so there probably is not a more qualified person uh, to have this conversation with. So we appreciate you joining us today. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks for your kind words. Uh, yeah, I uh, I get bored really quick and I like to take tests. Um, actually, I, I just have a, a real deep desire to learn about stuff uh, because when somebody asks me, Chuck, what do you think? I want to be able to give them a good educated answer. I don't want to, you know, uh, go down a rabbit hole without knowing where the rabbit hole goes. So uh, I, I to have a tendency to study a lot. And, you know, the best way to figure out if your studying works is to take a test. And once you do the test, you get the credentials. So I end up with, a, you know, alphabet soup. <laughs> Can't argue with that. And, and, and that alphabet soup is a pretty good indicator that uh, you know what you're talking about, which is a good place for us to start. Uh, ironically enough, we talk about some of the, the new functions of uh, of those enterprise office spaces and collaboration spaces. One of those is content creation. I see you're at your studio today, which is really cool because uh, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. But Chuck, you know, especially as we look at these, these IT and technology teams who have taken a lot of this burden uh, of designing these spaces, retrofitting has been a pretty common solution. In, in your opinion, why are you seeing a lot of these retrofit trends, uh, you know, really starting to permeate the industry? Well, uh, I'll tell you, Ben, retrofitting collaboration areas uh, to become IT and tech enabled spaces can provide several benefits that can positively impact workplace productivity and collaboration. Uh, one of the key benefits is that it can promote greater communication and connectivity amongst team members. Uh, by integrating such uh, large displays and video conferencing equipment and collaboration software, employees could easily share information and ideas with one, one another, uh, regardless of their location. Another benefit is it can enhance the quality of speed of decision making. You know, nowadays, everything is it, it has to be done fast. It has to be done right. We have to be able to make a decision on this now. Time is money. Money is time. So we want to make sure we can make informative decisions quickly. Um, Collaboration tools such as project management software and workflow automation systems and digital whiteboards can help teams stay organized and on track with their goals. Uh, collaboration spaces can promote uh, more engagement and more activity. Uh, employees can actually see what other employees are doing and, and kind of pitch in where normally they wouldn't have been able to see what they're working on. And, and you know, uh, being an educator, I know some people take their input different ways. Some are visual, some are auditory, some are kinesthetic. They have to touch things or they have to draw stuff. So being able to include everyone in these collaboration spaces is clutch. And here's the the uh, the whole trick for IT is knowing what to do, not just, hey, there's this new tool out, there's this new toy out, there's this new technology out, but being able to incorporate that seamlessly into the room and for not a lot of money and for not a lot of time. That's another, you know, here's our big factors. We have scope of work, we have budget, and we have schedule. And making all those things play together so we can get something cohesive is a, a big thing. Um, being able to have enough connectivity for everyone in the room, not just connectivity for the computers we're using in the room to communicate far in, but to get our information where we need to go. And a lot of this information, just like when we deal with AV over IP, 
Video files are huge. The latency that goes between them has to be very, very low. When you have that high latency, it's, it's not a good conversation. So uh, having good uh, throughput for these rooms. Um, what new things can we do? This is always a thing for IT professionals in retrofitting rooms. What new technologies? Is there a drawing pad? Or I just recently, uh, in the last couple of years, saw this thing that was for teaching, and it's a big whiteboard, but it's clear, right? So I could draw up on the screen, and it looks like I'm drawing on the screen. And other people can comment and, and do things and see it right there up in front of me. Um, new uh AR and VR technologies. You know, if you can collaborate with somebody on the far end via via AR or VR, they could see what's going on. And I know AR and VR hasn't really been taken off like it should uh, in some collaboration spaces. But you know, some of that technology being able to actually both of us put our hands on something and, and turn a widget and see what it does. So uh, these tools and and being able to integrate with our platforms, with our UC platforms, with Teams and Zoom and all the, the UC platforms we use. These are really the challenges of uh, IT departments now. Uh, how can we get it better, faster, cheaper, and make it more friendly for everyone involved? Well, Chuck, you, t you talk about better, faster, cheaper. One of the best ways to do that, obviously, is, is retrofitting existing spaces. Instead of you know, having new builds, you're breaking down walls, you're doing th things like that. But you know, there are a lot of considerations, especially when you talk about spatial integration, right? So being able to to leverage an existing room, whether it's, you know, infrastructure, whether it's uh, cabling, whether it's, you know, even the shape of a room for things like audio and microphone pickups, right? What are some of those those considerations on that spatial side that, that people can help alleviate, at least initially on the front? Well, one of the big things as a CTSD, as a designer, one of the things I, uh, the first and foremost thing I think about when redesigning or retrofitting a room is the room layout. It has to be conducive for the human. If it's not conducive for the human, you can have all the technology in the world and it's just going to go bye-bye. Uh, no one's going to want to use the room. If the chairs are cramped, if the lighting's too dim, if the room just sounds bad, if you're in a big glass fishbowl. So that room layout has to be conducive to everyone in the room. And then and once we have a good room layout, we have enough room for people to move around, to be comfortable, uh, integrating that technology. Like you said, uh, if I don't have to re-pull cable, why not? Why, why would I? If I don't have to knock down a wall, why would I? So if I can get a room layout that works for our humans, or I don't put too many humans in one room, and, and I can make that comfortable. Now what's in there that we can use? And I and I don't want to shoehorn technology into existing cabling. Like I want to make sure everything works together. So if I have new technology, but it needs new cable, we're going to have to budget for new cable because that will just become a pain in the whatever all the way down the line when we don't have that you know if you don't have that throughput and your meeting keeps skipping, but hey we we save 15 bucks on that on that cat five cable that's already there instead of pulling cat six um making our infrastructure strong our wi-fi and here's another thing that's really important is when we start talking about wi-fi what are the wi-fis around making sure we do good wi-fi scans so uh, during the middle of our meeting, we're on wireless and all of a sudden everybody starts connecting to the wireless and it jams it up. Um, so uh, we want to make sure all these things are uh, taken into consideration. Uh, I'll tell you, lighting and the, the audio environment, you know, when we start talking to IT environments about uh, IT professionals about retrofitting, they think about the technology, which is their job. It is their job to think about the technology. So they start, start thinking about the bandwidth. They start thinking about the computers, about the apps. But like if we don't, if we can't see as a human, or if all I see is the screen and people can't see my camera, then it's just a wash at that point. Your far end might as well not even participate. Or if they can't hear the microphone. Uh, the far end's just at a huge disadvantage. And it's no longer a collaboration space. It's a it's a kind of like a keep up with me space. So uh, those are some of the things that we really want to make sure. And then here's another thing that often gets overlooked is sustainability of this room. How long is this room going to last? Uh, the technology we put in today, is it going to be able to be retrofitted in three years, four years? Uh, if I pull cable today, can I still use this cable five years later? Is CAT 6A going to be a good enough thing? Um, do we have things, little things like uh, automatic lights when there's you know no motion or heat in the room uh, from an IR sensor or from a, a motion sensor? Do the lights shut off? Um, ease of use. I went to a conference room at a buddy of mine's uh, office 
few weeks ago. And I said, okay, where's your control system? He said, God, just plug in. And I said, well, all you have is a USB-C cable. He's like, yeah, just plug into it. And I plugged into it and the whole room came on, the lights adjusted, like everything just happened. And I was like, bravo, mate, bravo. And it was beautiful. And those are the kind of things that IT professionals need to think about when we're upgrading a room. Uh, the less people have to put their hands on things, the easier it is. Now, with ease of use comes a lack of flexibility. You know, the more flexible it is, the harder it is to use. We have more choices and adjustments. The easier it is to use, the less flexible it is. So that's always a consideration to take in. So these are a lot of the factors that IT would have to think about when they're uh, going to retrofit a room and, you know, calling an AV professional and working together with them. Well, I love that you brought up ease of use, right? And usually when you think about ease of use, it's it's walk in, everything turns on, right? But a lot of times that's done so much earlier in the design process, right? Whereas technology professionals, we do have a tendency to shoehorn technology and maybe overcomplicate things. But the real hack, if you will, if you want to call it that, is to design for simplicity, right? Sometimes that's an all-in-one solution. Sometimes it's plug one cable in and everything turns on, right? Talk about the impact, especially as you're retrofitting maybe even pre-existing systems that are, we'll, we'll call them just rat's nests, right? Well, a lot of them. Talk about how you could convert some of those really hyper-technical spaces and really introduce a lot of that simplicity. So the big thing that I always do is I want to know what the user needs. That's going to be the core, the heart and soul of this whole system is what do you need? Do they need that rat's nest? Did somebody put that all that stuff in there just because it was cool or because they thought it was cool? Or does the user just need a Zoom meeting with a microphone that's clear and crisp and not a lot of echo? Do they need a couple of loudspeakers that they can hear the far end? Or does it need to be a, a big 5.1 or 7.2 system? So what are the end user's needs? This is the biggest thing. And I think this is the thing a lot of the times gets overlooked because we have a point of contact who's a technology professional. And then we have installers and retrofitters who are technology professionals. And we want to put in all the cool stuff, all the toys and bells and whistles. And this is the opportunity to make this room, you know, marvelous and minority report. And the end user who is maybe an accountant or uh, just a, uh, an administrative professional says, I, I need a Zoom. And, uh, I need to be able to Zoom, hear the Zoom, and talk to the Zoom. Um, <laughs> right. So uh, it's it's our job to kind of suss out, okay, they might not know what they might not know. Like, okay, do you guys ever share like drawings or ideas like that? Something you might want. Oh, yeah, it would be great to draw on that. Okay, cool. Let's add a new toy. But if they say no, no, we just share spreadsheets. Cool. That tells me not only do you need to zoom, but you don't need 4K. You barely need 1080 if all you're doing is spreadsheets. Because at 720, people still look great. The bandwidth is lower and your spreadsheets look beautiful. So it's it's really understanding those, those requirements from uh, what the customer needs. That's the big thing. Um, what does their far end need? Is, does their far end just need the camera? Do they open up their their Excel sheet? once it's sent or do they all look at it and collaborate right then and there? Um, and then monitoring these things, having some, here's another thing that often gets overlooked is feedback. How is this room serving you? Uh, people are not robots and technology changes. Users needs change. So the needs we have today in a year, they could have another need that, well, you know, uh, four years ago, this conference room was great, but since then we've grown and we've done this and this and this. Why wait for four years? If it's a, hey, I'd like to be able to incorporate a whiteboard. Cool. We could do that in a year, you know, a year after the system's built. Sure. It's real easy. So uh, taking all of those things into account, the, the end user being the most important part, what do they need? Uh, what can we do? What should we do? What should we not do? And uh, let's just make it as easy and functional for them to use as possible. And, you know, if it's Mr. Data using this thing, I'll give them a touch panel that has 50 buttons and, and uh, 200 pages and all the collaboration things you can want. If it's someone who's not as technologically, uh, technologically advanced, uh, here's a few buttons. Here's the things you need. Let's train you up. I want to make it, I want this tool to be as easy and functional for you as possible and not hinder your workflow. 
Well, Chuck, I, I love that answer because it really really puts the emphasis back on the person using using the technology, right? And not necessarily uh, those of us as much as we like to to have and use really cool technology. At the end of the day, uh, if we have a, a room that's loaded with stuff that, that people aren't using, right, we're not really serving our end users well. Right. And, you know, I want to kind of to to stick on that for a second, right? When you when you talk about, you know, rooms that <clears throat> rooms that have been designed probably in the last three, maybe two to three years, there's a renewed emphasis on things like accessibility and equity. And especially when you talk about uh, audio specifically and video specifically, intelligibility, listenability, uh, making sure that people are able to be seen. Those are really core objectives for a lot of these rooms. And, you know, a lot of the legacy spaces, even from a, an actual room layout standpoint, are not designed to optimize that. Talk about some of the ways that you can leverage maybe some of the newer audio and video technology to help alleviate some of those 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 challenges of space? Well, there's a, <clears throat> a few easy ways. Uh, video has come a long way. Uh, AV over IP has reduced the amount of infrastructure we need tremendously. Uh, there's a little bit more work involved in setting up your switch, coordinating with IT and things like that. But, you know, before, if we wanted uh, a matrix switcher to have five inputs and five outputs, we would have to buy a 16 channel matrix switcher. Now, if we want five inputs and five outputs, we get a 10 channel switch and bing, bang, boom, we're done. We could use that same 10 channel switch for two inputs and eight outputs. Uh, it's very, very flexible. And instead of having multi types of cables, just video cable, audio cable, control cable, and then your ethernet cable, we can have one cable that does everything. So this really reduces the number of cables that we have leaving the room, the, the amount of infrastructure we have. And things like uh, Dante. Dante has been a big hit. And, and a lot of the other uh, audio over IP uh, tools and protocols we have, <clears throat> We can have a microphone on a table that has a category cable going into a switch underneath the table. That switch is PoE, <clears throat> providing PoE power to the microphone. That switch is providing PoE power to the touch panel. Everything going into one switch, and then that one cable going out and leaving the room. And that's our connectivity. That could be our video, our audio. That's everything all in one fell swoop. So uh, retrofitting gets to be a lot easier in the scope of uh, infrastructure and a lot more cost effective. There is some understanding and learning curves that we're starting to experience with all this new technology and the retrofitting and with the audio. Here's the thing. My end user doesn't know and doesn't care. They just want their voice to get to the other side and the other side to get to their ears like a normal conversation. They don't care if it's analog. They don't care if it's digital. They don't care if it's EtherSound, Cobernet, Dante, AES67, or any of the acronyms we use. They just want to be able to see and hear. So as AV professionals, we kind of have to leverage what's what, what what's going to give us the best bang for the buck, both not just, hey, I might spend a little bit more on a, on a piece of AV over IP equipment if it's going to make my labor less, if it's going to be less... Uh, problems for me to integrate. That's why, you know, I keep saying Dante, but Dante is very easy to integrate and works with almost everybody, well, just about everybody. Um, so it's very, very easy to integrate. Uh, same thing with, with our uh, computers. Everything's going USB-C now. People don't even want an HDMI out. They just want that USB-C. It provides power. It provides video, audio, screen sharing, the whole nine. So one of the things we have to think about is how all of these different infrastructure things are affecting our end user. And really, if they have to do more tomorrow to get hooked up than they did yesterday with all the old cabling and the other things, it's not gonna be very uh, uh, very pleasurable for them. It's not gonna be a good experience. So when it comes to infrastructure and things like that, we wanna really make sure that we're using, you know, uh, somebody, I was teaching a class to some guys in Belgium and uh, they gave me a great quote can't remember the exact quote, but they said the best design is not how much more you can add, but how much you can take away and still have the functionality you want. Uh, you know, when I can start taking away all these these things that don't matter, the extra cables and extra stuff, and just give the give the people what they want and what they need, uh, then that's that's the greatest design. Simplistic, easy to use, and uh, 
making sure that, you know, it's not going to a break the bank, B break your, your brain housing group, trying to figure out things, uh, and, and C being e- easy for everyone to install and, and, and simple, very simple designs. Well, Chuck, I'll ask you this too, and it's not necessarily exclusive to to the retrofit world, but this is something that you could speak to really well. Is as an educator, as a certifier, you know, one of the biggest hurdles to jump is that initial training, right? Whether it's uh, supporting, whether it's uh, teaching, reteaching people how to use the room. What are some just a couple of quick tips that you have uh, where whether it's a retrofit, whether it's a new build, that we're, we're, where we can help onboard some of those users in a much quicker manner? Well, one of the first things I like to do is figure out who my users are. Um, I can much better teach people when I know who the people are, uh, how they like their input, what they're used to using. Um, so before I even go in and start designing training, uh, I, I need to do some user testing, some usability testing. Uh, what are my, what's the problems my end users having? Uh, what are some of the things my system's going to solve and put those two together and figure out, okay, this is your problem. I'm going to teach you how to solve it with this thing. Uh, next thing I want to do is make sure I provide a comprehensive training. Um, I usually have a couple different ty- types of trainings I, I do, the end user training, the technical training for like the IT teams and the AV team, <clears throat> maybe the executive training to say, uh, come in here, plug in here. If it doesn't work, call this number. Um, so I want to make sure I, I have a couple different types of training. And when I do my training, I want to make sure that the training sticks as a AV professional. I can go in to a room in an hour and tell you everything that room has to offer. Are you going to remember it? Maybe not. If there's a thousand things that room has, you're not going to remember anything but the last, you know, 998, 999, and a thousand. So as an educator, I know there's something called Bloom's Taxonomy, which I want to make sure that I constantly incorporate into my training. Bloom's Taxonomy uh, tells me that people have to remember things. Then they have to understand those things and then be able to apply those. Those are the first three steps. So I don't want to make training overwhelming. I don't want to give you everything in a two-hour block. I want to give you the things in a two-hour block that you can actually ingest and use. And then after you're done and you want some further training, I want to be able to direct you, okay, after you guys get good at this, watch this video, it's online, and you'll get a better understanding of these technologies and we'll move forward there. So uh, anytime I provide a training or, or uh, a class, I want to make sure people walk out with a full understanding of what we've gone over. Uh, I want to make sure the technology is intuitive. Uh, if I have to press, you know, five different pages to get something going. All the training in the world doesn't matter. That's just a pain in the butt, right? So if the technology can be intuitive, if I plug in an HDMI cable and it automatically pulls up that input, you know, where do I want to put that input if I have different outputs? Um, I want to leave my training uh, or my trainees, my end users with written documentation. Again, no one's going to remember everything. Very few times I'll go in and they'll remember everything in a two hour training. So I want to make sure they have some written documentation. Nowadays with things like YouTube and the internets, I can make a video and say, hey, I'm going to train you guys in all this stuff. We're going to go over it. I'm going to answer your questions. If you forgot whatever we talked about, there's a video on that. And I love doing that. I and So I've been doing a lot of study groups lately. And I actually give the people the videos before class. So they watch the videos and they get a chance to ingest this information and then they develop questions. And then when they come to class, they're like, okay, I remember this. And I had a question about this. How does this thing work? And I'm like, that's great. Those are great techniques because if I just give you the information in the class, you think about that stuff later and kind of get lost. But if I give you the content prior to class, you really have a chance to chew on it and develop some of those questions that you might not have during class. So that's a whole flip classroom model. So prior to a training, I'm going to say, hey, guys, we're going to train on this thing. Here's some videos to watch on that. Chew on this stuff, and we'll talk about it. And then, uh, again, after I'm done with the training, I want to make sure if they do have uh, questions that they have uh, an avenue for that support, some kind of technical support, uh, someplace to go and a knowledge base just to type in, or, hey, email me, hit me up on uh, Teams or hit me up on Facebook Messenger or Twitter. Uh, Find me, ask me questions. And I get asked a lot of questions during the day, and uh, I always get back to people because, you know, if you have a question about something we talked about and you didn't fully get the answer, that's my whole job is to make sure you have the answers. So, um, 
those are some of the things I, I want to do during training for my end users. Make sure they have all the information. Make sure they understand the information. Make sure they have ample time with the information to formulate those questions. Some written documentation that they can go back and make notes on and a way for them to get in touch with me after we're done. Well, Chuck, look, I think that's a great place to land the plan. I love uh, the focus on really the end user experience, the training, the retention, things like that. It It is something that it's refreshing to see the industry really pivot back toward is uh, leveraging uh, really technology to help empower people, right? And, and everything not just being a solution in a box. Uh, as cool as it is to have awesome technology, if we're not serving and supporting and training our end users, uh, that we're failing as an industry. So uh, with that said, Chuck Espinosa, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, hope to have you on again soon. Great. Thanks a lot, Ben. Had a great time. Enjoyed being here. Appreciate it.